Hey, good morning to everybody. Happy Monday. It's Daryl here. It's bright and freaking early, man. It's 3.30 a.m. here in Connecticut on the East Coast. Okay, I just downloaded the first video. I'm downloading two back-to-back -back videos this morning, kind of in celebration of my 17th anniversary of being clean and sober. Since October 23rd of 2006, I've been clean and sober. Um, I have some links down below because I, rem I remember being in one of the many, the over a dozen detoxes or rehabs and we, we, there was 35 of us sitting in a room. It was at a hospital and it was a detox and we were 35 of us, 30, 35 people. It was a full room and there were two counselors talking and they were talking about how statistics, statistically saying that only two people out of the 30 or 35 people in that room would eventually make it to be clean and sober for more than, I think it was for, I think they said for more than a year. I've looked up some statistics and this is why I don't bring up these statistics often because they vary. Personally, I think that's what I just said is pretty close to it. Uh, I found another one down below where people that suffer from alcoholism, uh, it's an 18% success rate for the first year. 18 will make it one year. Here's the, here's the brighter side of that. And the first three to six months is the hardest. That's where you have the biggest relapse rate. I was also reading too, I think it said 40 to 60% uh, of people relapse, uh, either addicts or alcoholics, uh, will relapse. I've talked about that before. Personally, some people would disagree with me, but personally, I, I believe that relapse is actually part of recovery. It was for me. Uh, up to before October 23rd, I was making it about every three months. I was clean and I, I, I would, I, it was a secret thing. I all I did all by myself, you know, people, everybody I told everybody I was clean and everything. And then I'd save up money and I'd wait for a day where I knew I wasn't getting any drug tests, like from the uh, methadone clinic I was going to. And, uh, you know, I, I pick like a perfect day and I'd go off by myself with uh, three or $400 and I would just use by myself all day. And it, I did this about three times over a period of about nine months. And I, I, I'd go into the, to the methadone clinic the next day and every day I got called, for, every time I got called for a uh, random urine and I would get caught and I would lose all my privileges that you have pri privileges that come with staying clean for any certain amount of time in there. Uh, on October 23rd, was the worst day of my life. I, it was just one terrible thing after the other. I, I, locked, I, I went off on my own to use and I locked myself out of my car. I had run-ins with the police. Uh, just, just one thing after the next. I ended up sitting alone in a parking lot and uh, I, I couldn't get hold of any dealers. And I had $20 left in change in quarters. And it was all the last of my money. I went through $400. And I was sitting in a cold parking lot. It was cold for October 23rd. And people were coming in and out of the store. That I, was, I was sitting in a dark parking lot. And they were coming out. And it was families buying Halloween stuff and like that. And I was all by myself. Dark car. The car was shut off because I didn't want to attract attention. And I had, you know, quarters in my hand. And I called up somebody I didn't even know. Didn't even know this guy because I couldn't get a hold of anybody else. And he didn't show up, and I call again. That back then I didn't have a cell phone. I I get out, I use the payphone, I go back to my car. I sat there for almost three hours, from like eight o'clock to eleven o'clock at night, waiting for somebody I don't even know to come and take my last twenty dollars, not even it's probably like eighteen dollars in change, you know. And this all that would have done was prolong and make the agony worse for like five minutes. That if if, if anybody's familiar with rock. That's, that's what it would have done. It would have just made things that much worse. And I asked myself, you know, I was sitting there watching these families come in and out, you know, and I thought about the whole day, the terrible day that I just had, you know, just one thing after the next. And I, I said, if this, I told myself, if this isn't a sign from God, if this is not a actual sign from God, then I don't know what is, you know, that I'm doing the wrong thing here. You know, how much fun, do, you know, why, why, am I do, why am I doing this to myself? You know, and I ended up going home and I was angry that I had to, I had to bring that $20 and quarters or $18 and quarters home with me. I was actually angry that I couldn't, I couldn't torture myself further, but I thought about it, you know, after that night, I just, I, that was it. That was the last time I ever used 17 years ago today. Okay. If you watch, I want you to watch the last video because I, I talk about there, I talk about anorexia a little bit and there's a woman that I talked about. And the, my concern is that other people uh, that might suffer, potentially suffer or are suffering from eating disorders will watch her 
and kind of idolize her and kind of look at it like, you know, like she's got a good life. She's, she's wealthy. She's got a lot of followers. She's got millions of followers. She's wealthy. She's got beautiful clothes. She's a, you know, a, a creator on YouTube and TikTok, you know, and you know, they would, they would, I, you know, they would rationalize an eating disorder. And I know because I used to do that there, there's a particular, when I first got clean and sober, I, I stopped. I didn't listen. I changed all the music I listened to because it was a trigger for me, just like the song I'm going to mention now. And uh, I actually bought music that I used to listen to in one of the happiest periods of my life when I was about uh, nine, eight, nine, ten, eleven years old in the, in the mid, late to late, mid to late seventies. Uh, I bought uh, Neil Diamond CDs. Seriously, back when I was forty, first time when I first got clean and sober, I bought the Bee Gees. I bought Johnny Cash. My, my music taste changed completely when I got clean and sober. And as time went on, I was able to go back and listen to that music again, which brings me to this song. I used to listen, this was, I used to listen to a lot of music when I was using. And this one song was my anthem. I cranked it up whenever I used, you know, I, I remember multiple, I can remember right now, multiple times sitting in my apartment or somebody else's place, cranking this song up, singing it you know, indulging in my, my addiction. And the song is lit up by Buck Cherry. And, uh, if you watch the the song is phenomenal. It's just got such a great hook and guitar. And, uh, but in the song, he, he says, I love that cocaine. I love that cocaine. This is a song. These are lyrics to a song I'm talking about for the YouTube algorithms. You know, and it was like my anthem back then. And I stopped listening to it. when I got clean and sober. I just, I wanted nothing to do with that song until just recently. I, you know, I st- I can listen now. It's been 17 years and I, I'm in a different place now. And I don't have the same triggers as I used to have. And I've listened, I can listen, I listen to some of the music I used to listen to. And I thought about Josh Todd the singer for Buck Cherry, just, this was about a month ago. For some reason, he came in my head. I think I heard the song on the radio. And I was like, oh my God, that guy, he can't still be alive. You know, the way he was in that video, because he, he looked like, you know, I, I would have swore this guy was lit up, was actually lit up. You know, so I Googled, just a month ago, just one month ago before today, I Googled Josh Todd. And I was in for quite a surprise. Josh Todd has been clean and sober for 27 years. He's been sober since he was 26 years old. That song was made in 1999. He was already three years clean and sober when he did that song, that song that I idolized, that was my my anthem. He was clean and sober. I wish I knew that then. I I wish to God I knew that then. There's gonna be some excellent, excellent links down below. Uh, there's one from, I believe it's loud wire and it talks about this and it's great. I've talked to you guys before about how I can, uh, you know, after 17 years and going to hundreds of NA and a meetings, I got a pretty good sense of when I hear somebody, I know if they're really clean and sober or not, you know, cause they feel that, you know, you, you know, how, I know how I feel inside. I know what I've been through. And if I, when I hear somebody else, you know, describe it, bam, you know, I know that person's been through it too. He's, you know, he's where I am. You know, so I know when somebody's actually clean and sober. I've talked about this in uh, Bam Margera videos before. And, you know, there's times now he seems clean and sober. But uh, so when I read this article about Josh Todd, I was just amazed that he was actually clean and sober when he did this video. The link to the video will be down below. If you never saw this video before, if you like rock music or heavy rock or, or metal at all or uh, glam, you'll, you'll, you'll love this song. If you like Guns N' Roses, you'll love this song. Uh, Or maybe not, because of what he sings about. But like I said, he was clean and sober when he did this song. And he talks, and he actually became a phlebotomist during the pandemic. You watch this video, and you watch this guy in the video. Like I said, I thought for sure that he was either in jail or or passed away. And I'll be damned, he he was clean and sober when he did this video. And uh, that's one of the things, like he became a phlebotomist. And it's like me discovering art. You know, when you get clean and sober, you discover your real passions, what you were meant to do. For Josh Todd, it was being a phlebotomist. You know, it's just, it's just something that you always wanted to do in your heart. And you forget about that in addiction, you know. And once you become clean and sober, you know, you, you remember who you were really meant to be. Here's one of the, the paintings I did 
a long time ago. And it's a hand. It's and I had an idea for this. This this was something an image that popped up in my head. This is just something in my imagination. And it's in the addiction, in the darkness of addiction, reaching out into the light, you know, into recovery, into the light, coming out of the light, the darkness. You could actually, I, I started to paint his chest there and his arm and uh, wood floor. I, I, I like the way I did the wood floor. Um, you know, and I discovered painting for my, myself. And I discovered, I, you know, I remembered who I was. I, I've said this before. And people, if, you, if you're not clean and sober, you might not understand. I, I, I became the Daryl that I was meant to be. You know, I got my soul back. You know, and if you're not familiar with being, you know, if you're not sober yourself, maybe you, you think I'm exaggerating or something. But I mean that in the truest sense of the word. I got my soul back when I became clean and sober. I just got goosebumps. I swear on the Bible. Uh, there's other things he says. He, ta he talks about a moment of clarity in this Loudwire interview down below. And if you watch my channel at all, you know I've talked about, you know, I had this moment. That's Like I said, when I was sitting in that car on Halloween with my change, I had this moment of clarity. You know, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this to myself? You know, and I saw people, it was like I was watching a, a movie, you know, that I couldn't get, I, it was like I was watching an alien landscape, you know, I felt disconnected from society, from everything, it was the worst, one of the worst feelings, um, and it was that moment of clarity, and he, like I said, this is how I could tell, this is, these are things, you know, that I could tell, and he talks about how he wanted to get clean for his kids, or he was going to have a girl, I think. He was going to have a child, and he wanted to get clean for her. He talks about being arrested, about a DUI. And he says he had this moment of clarity where he knew that there was no, you know, the, the result of where he was headed was either jail or death or insanity. You know, and that's that's what I, that's the conclusion I came to sitting in that car. You know, for real, again, I got goosebumps. I swear to God, I got goosebumps again. You know, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. When I say these things, you know, in the truest sense of the word, I knew that's where I was headed, you know, and, and being clean and sober, you know, at first I could never imagine it. You know, I could never imagine, I, I had never been, my whole life, I had never been so really sober during an intimate encounter with a woman. You know, I started drinking when I was 14 or 15 years old, and I was terrified of that. I couldn't imagine being intimate, could not imagine, it scared, scared the hell out of me. And uh, now I found that oh, I, what I was missing out on all this time, you know, it is so much better, you know, being, I, and I mean, I swear on, swear on the Bible, man, that it's so much better. The last 17 years have been the best years of my life. And I mean that in every sense of the word, uh, financially, happiness, health wise, I was up to almost 300 pounds. My, uh, my cholesterol was through the roof. My blood pressure was through the roof. Uh, my teeth were all rotted out at the gum lines. These are false teeth. Every tooth, every every single tooth was rotted at the gum at the gum line. Brown and black, broken off from rock cocaine. Recovery is possible. Not only is it possible, but it's the best freaking life I've ever lived in my 57 years. I'll be back later with another video. Today is, like I said, my anniversary. It's a special day, and I'm going to be talking about this more later today and tomorrow. Have a good Monday.